Um, and I was just describing sort of the topic uh, uh, and the various different uh, points I was going to make throughout the presentation. So uh, after the sequence of events that we uh, that we took following the initial discovery, we uh, had a set of decisions to make on what management alternatives to take. Uh, we did that through both a lot of internal discussions and, and public involvement and uh, ultimately decided to treat with rotenone, which is a uh, fish uh, pesticide. And uh, I'm going to talk, even though it doesn't really uh, pertain so much to the rapid response, uh, how we uh, went about trying to restore the fishery afterwards and then finish up with some conclusions. So as I mentioned, in May of, of 08, in fact, we were sitting down to plan our field schedule for the upcoming uh, summer, and uh, we got a call that someone felt that they uh, had collected a couple of snakeheads, and they said that they had thrown them in the trash, and I said, well, you know, could you possibly send us a picture? So uh, that uh, later on that uh, that day, we received this on our computer, a picture. doesn't <clears throat> look like you might be able to... Uh, tell what kind of fish it is necessarily, but we were pretty certain it was a northern snakehead. And uh, so we went out there uh, the next day and uh, felt it was pretty important. And, and the main reason was that uh, we felt that if, if they were in fact present in the, in the small little pond where this guy caught, caught one, um, that they could potentially reproduce and, uh, and get out into the greater uh, Hudson drainage and ultimately uh, you know, that would be one step closer to, you know, uh, getting up into the whole canal system and, and throughout the state and, and into the United States, possibly even Canada. So we felt like, um, like this was something we had to obviously check into right away. Um, the distribution throughout the U.S. Is, is, is pretty limited. And, in fact, many of you are familiar with these maps. I mean, they, they highlight a whole watershed whenever a, a, a species is found. So here we have this little red spot here, which includes the whole Wallkill uh, drainage. And in fact, it was just one tiny little spot in Orange County. And, um, you know, that was part of what went into our, our management decision here to go forward with um, a, an eradication effort because it was a small little spot that we felt was manageable. But, you know, one of the things that really uh, became critical, you know, in our minds was that uh, something really had to be done quickly, um, in part because the fish can spawn several times over the summer. They, they produce a lot of young, and uh, they protect their young. So on top of the fact that um, they have, a, you know, a good, uh, good chance of, of uh producing a lot of fish over the course of the summer. They also, by protecting them, the survival of those fish are, are, are pretty high. Um, once they start to grow, they, they can eat almost anything, and they survive New York winters. And on top of all that, um, they can live outside of water for quite a long time by um, actually respiring, you know, without being in the water itself. They can, in essence, breathe air and uh, They've been known to, you know, move short distances over wetland. So they're a tough, tough critter to get rid of um, if they can become established. Well, in Catlin Creek, we had uh, uh, a, a sort of a, a an ideal situation where we had um, this these spots where the green uh, stars are showing right here, being where the, the initial reports of the fish were from. And uh, this is really pretty much the headwaters of a tiny stream that comes into this lake. This is a 28-acre lake called Ridgebury Lake. This is Catlin Creek that comes down for about a two-mile stretch and goes through these red wetland areas. Um, and there's a couple of in-stream ponds along the way. Uh, and then there's a big in-stream pond down here called Hyde Pond. It's not really big. It's, you know, three acres maybe. Um, and then there's a, a culvert that goes under this Route 6. And... Uh, we felt like there might be a chance that the fish were limited to this area. And, and we felt that way because immediately after verifying that this guy actually caught a snakehead, we went out and really hit it hard with nets and electrofishing and a variety of techniques and, and could not find any snakeheads. So we thought, well, this population is pretty small. Maybe there was just a couple of adults out here and we, we got at it early. Uh, but in, uh, in mid-June, we did find some small fish, um, 
And so uh, we felt, okay, well, they've already uh, started to, to reproduce. And uh, so that put us on this uh, – on this graph, probably at this earliest stage um, of the invasion, before they really started to uh, increase in abundance to any great degree. But because it was high in the watershed, we felt, well, maybe we have a chance. And so there was a variety of internal di discussions going on over this two-week period, but um, it, it was hard to get wholesale uh, backing especially higher up in our administration until we actually collected some ourselves in the field. Once we did that, things really started to take off in, on, on a fast order. Um, initially, we thought, well, you know, just in case uh, there's, you know, we found the epicenter and it happened to be this small little pond and there was more fish out there, we'll put barriers in um, the Catlin Creek. And these were just what we could buy at a hardware. I mean, these really wouldn't do much in any sort of rain event, but it might have prevented some fish from moving. And that was our just initial, you know, quick attempt to prevent fish from moving. But then we, um, once we started collecting, you know, some fish down in these small ponds, we went ahead and, uh, you know, got a little more serious. This downstream culvert at Route 6, we put in a, a, a little more substantial barrier. We worked with the Department of uh, Transportation to get that done. And we um, we sent out a letter to all the residents um, in and around the Catlin Creek and Ridgebury Lake that we wanted to, you know, get them involved in our plans for uh, how we hope to try and eradicate this fish. And shortly after sending out that letter, we got a, a picture from someone sent to us from Ridgebury Lake, which is that lake um, at the head of this this bigger lake right here. Uh, that he had caught an adult snake head there. And so we felt like, all right, well, maybe that's, in fact, where the fish first were stocked and that then some of them went over uh, into the creek down below. Uh, so what do we do now? Well, there's a variety of management options that we considered. Um, most of this was done initially just internally and then uh, with, you know, a small group of fisheries people and then as we, uh, uh, you know, found more and more uh, evidence that the population was uh, really, you know, established. Uh, it, it got, you know, elevated to much higher levels very quickly. But uh, we felt like no action was really not a good idea. A biological control was ruled out because there's really not a, any sort of biological control that's effective. Um, Trying to prevent further dispersal, I mean, we were doing some effort in that regard by putting these barriers in place, but usually those aren't going to work in floods anyway, even if you put pretty substantial barriers in place, and they don't really work for small fish very well. Um, Dewatering the areas where the fish were, well, that doesn't really work so well because these fish have shown that they can weather even very, very dry conditions and, uh, and eke out an existence, and they, we probably would, wouldn't be successful there. Um, it's also you, in fisheries and all pretty much aquatic work, I mean, to try and, uh, you know, capture and remove all the snakeheads while leaving other species alone, I mean, it's very difficult to do that. It's like, you know, ultimately you're searching for the needle in the haystack and you're always going to leave some behind um, to, you know, ultimately uh, reestablish themselves. So uh, full eradication through... Uh, through the area where we had found the fish was what we thought might be the best option. And we had a, a draft national management plan for northern snakehead that really uh, would have guided us in that same direction. And they, there were other states that had done successful eradication, so we felt like, you know, we can use some of that to really uh, make our case. Um, and these other, you know, points that there are other, you know, state and national policies that, uh, you know, are pointing to the fact that these are dangerous fish to ind indigenous fish populations and that, you know, that all worked in our favor, that all of this was pretty much set up ahead of time. Um, we also had that experience from the other states. And, you know, in some cases, it, the, the fish had escaped beyond any manageable area, and there's really nothing that can be done. Um, however, in areas where it was isolated and in a manageable area, um, they were people generally tried to eradicate them. And there were success stories and others that weren't so successful. But, um, you know, in the end, it, it seemed like the most successful type of technique was rotenone, which is this fish uh, pesticide. And so um, uh, we went forward, you know, with that type of uh, uh, proposal when we went into that public meeting in June. So 
just to go back, within about a month's time, uh, we had garnered support throughout our own agency and brought in the town officials and notified the public that we were going to, you know, go forward with a plan. And here was a proposed plan, but we wanted to make it clear that, you know, this was what we were proposing, but we wanted to provide information and get some feedback. Um, so we did do that. We had to describe what Rotenone was, how it was very selective to fish, and it had worked on northern snakeheads. Other chemicals, you know, were not very good uh, for a variety of reasons. So we went through the whole proposal with the different, uh, uh, well, many times with our own department uh, staff, but then also uh, with the public trying to, uh, you know, allow everyone to understand what the whole picture would look like and and what was needed. Um, and, you know, in essence, we were going to treat the 28-acre Ridgebury Lake, the two miles of Catlin Creek. Um, we had four private ponds that were connected within that stream um, and the whole wetland down below. And so we had been through this area searching for the snakeheads, not finding them in many places, although uh, we felt like Hyde Pond, which is the downstream most pond right before it went under that Route 6 bridge, uh, was likely as far down as they may have gotten. And then we wanted to, you know, go back and reass uh, reassess how effective we may have been over time. So who did we really need to get, get involved in this? Over this sort of month-long period from, once, from when they were first discovered until we were at these public meetings, we needed to have, you know, a, good leadership both at the regional level and up in Albany where a lot of you know staff was uh, present and where the highest level administration folks were. And so the Invasive Species Coordination, uh, uh, the Office of Invasive Species Coordination with Leslie and Steve Sanford at the time were very, uh, very important in that Albany role. Um, and then Bureau of Fisheries both uh, in this region and, you know, up in Albany were also very important in uh, trying to, you know, organize the variety of people involved. And we had folks from our, our legal department because there were a lot of legal issues here. Um, I, in that second bullet, when I when I'd say that there were high level support from administration, ultimately they did make an, uh, an emergency, and we were able to convince them that this was worthy of a an emergency determination from the commissioner, and that you know time was of the essence, and that we had to do something as soon as possible. These fish were probably by that point in time spawning out there. There was the threat that their dispersal would be you know that much greater. That this you know uh, exponential portion of that curve that I showed, where the abundance of fish. Uh, you know, could explode at any point was made. And um, you know, we were able to ultimately, you know, make that convincing case. And by getting an emergency determination, it allowed for us to devote uh, staff time from a variety of divisions throughout the whole department and, um, you know, take people off of work that they had been uh, involved with. And in particular, that's difficult with our legal staff because they're involved in many big projects that are, you know, months and months in the in the preparation. And, you know, to pull them off of that to deal with this particular issue um, was difficult. But um, they, by having that emergency determination, we were able to do that. Um, there were permits that we needed to get. Uh, we had to involve pesticide staff in, in, in helping us get some of those permits. We had Division of Water involved uh, because there was concerns about what the Rotenone might do within the water to, you know, for drinking water supplies, for groundwater supplies, that type of thing. We needed the, um, the health department to also get involved in that. Uh, we had our wetlands people. Uh, in our habitat involved, and they also are very involved in chemical testing, what the impacts to various chemicals are on other organisms, not just fish. Um, we had real property involved within our department to help us assess who all the property owners were in the treatment area and how to get in touch with them. The town officials were very helpful in that regard, too. We had our Department of Transportation involved, uh, the State Department of Transportation, because of these culverts that we were blocking temporarily and more permanently. They were also very involved in helping us uh, secure areas for composting some of the dead fish afterwards. 
Um, I can't remember the name of the agency, maybe Leslie, you remember, but there's an emergency services group that is capable of responding to emergencies of all different types. Uh, so if you had such, uh, flooding or something like that in a, in a town, they have all these big pumps and, and pipes and you know materials that you can use. We were able to bring them in to help us with finding pumps to pump down a lake, which I will get into in a little uh, in a minute here, uh, as part of our treatment. Federal Fish and Wildlife Service were involved in helping us set up some fish tanks, which I'll also show to you in, in a minute. Um, and then also, uh, they were very helpful in providing us with some machinery in in a follow-up treatment in 2009 to help us uh, work through some of the more difficult terrain. And then last but not least, we had forest rangers and our ECOs involved in uh, a variety of roles. Um, one of the most important was to help us establish sort of an incident command center uh, during the treatment period. Um, so when we got to the um, public meeting on July 8th, um, we uh, had to explain our concerns, the decision process, the use of the road known, how we were going to need access across private property. We had to discuss safety of road known to a great degree. In particular, people were concerned that somehow it might get into the groundwater. And this, in part, was due to people having some preconception of what these fish, uh, you know, were like in their own minds. And, and that's why I have these slides up here for, of, of the, you know, movies that were out there. So people recognized that these fish were some sort of threat. They had, you know, they didn't really have any ideas what these fish were really like. But they, uh, so we had to explain all that. But then they also searched on the Internet about rotenome and found that there were you know a lot of a lot of misinformation out there um, that kind of resulted from sort of the initial response that people may have had after there was going to be some rotenone treatments in a public drinking supply and so even though it didn't really apply in this case they had concerns about okay well i have a well that's you know not too far away from this lake is it going to be contaminated with this stuff so we had to you know put out sort of these brush fires that we maybe didn't necessarily anticipate at first. Um, and then uh, we had to discuss with them uh, how we were going to reestablish this fishery. That wasn't necessarily something we had uh, wanted to do, uh, you know, but we felt like uh, it was the appropriate thing to do. And then once we, uh, we uh, got, you know, the response from the public, then we felt like it was really a necessary part of it. Oh, um, the... Uh, so I, we did talk about rote known, and, and basically I just will say here that we felt like it really was not something that uh, would have any lasting toxicity. And it, in fact, it was something that our department had used many, many times and still does in other water bodies. So we really felt pretty confident about describing how it works and, and what uh, what the potential, you know, Side effects and uh, were for other species of fish, which are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty few. Um, it really just affects fish and or, and gilled organisms. Um, and uh, so, even if other fish eat dead fish, they are not uh, affected through digestion of of uh, the toxin or anything like that. So, uh, I'll, I'll try to go through this part really pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, treating the actual different types of habitats out there was quite a challenge. Um, we mapped out the entire area and broke it up into various different, we called them divisions, uh, because with our incident command folks, that was sort of terminology that they were uh, familiar with, our, our forest rangers. So we, you know, treated the inlet areas, we treated the lake. Each of these are sort of dealt with separately. Um, and part of the reason we broke it up this way was not just in how it was going to be treated, but then also ways in which we could sort of keep track of, okay, how many fish came out of each section, um, and we could sort of track how how this, uh, you know, uh, invasion, you know, was distributed throughout that whole uh, area that was treated. Um, one thing I'll just mention is we normally use a chemical, chemical called Prenfish, um, and people who, with the public, recognized that there were some issues with that, one being odor. Um, there was a lot of misinformation, too, and that there had been some contaminants in some batches of Pren fish in the past. And so they thought, well, maybe this stuff would have uh, other chemicals mixed in it 
they were concerned about that. Um, ultimately, they we all found a, an alternate type of rote known, which was very new, called CFT legumine, which didn't have an odor. Um, it also was pretty new. We had not registered it in New York State, um, and this was a, another legal issue that we then had to go through is, is how to get it registered in New York State. So we had to quickly go through a process to do that. We then also had to get a special local needs uh, desi- uh, you know, permit condition that would allow for us to treat at a level that was up to what the label requirement allowed for, which was five parts per million of rote known, as opposed to what New York normally would treat with and allow was one part per million. So we had to find a bunch of scientific literature that showed why we had to use this use it at a higher level. And it turns out that, you know, snakeheads are a little less susceptible to rote known than some other fish species, but at at the label requirements of around four parts to five parts per million, it they it is effective. So that was all a part of what we had to uh uh some of the hurdles we had to to, you know, surmount and it was all speeded up by this emergency determination because it really helped put a lot of staff on it. We um, were able to then go through the area once we, uh, right before we ultimately did get all the approvals and, and, and uh, were planning to treat, which turned out to be at the beginning of August of that year, we had to go through and sort of clear the area uh, so that we can actually move through it with our, our boats and our various different equipment. Uh, we also promised the people that we would try to capture as many fish from Ridgebury Lake as we can, hold them in some tanks, and then restock them after the uh, rote known treatment. Um, so we worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to put together some of these tanks right at the town hall. Um, we uh, it was pretty a uh, pretty pretty big deal. I mean, to work with all of this plumbing and all the pumps and get the thing up and running. We even had to truck water in to do this. And keep in mind, we had a really pretty small budget uh, for this whole thing. It was, you know, as far as actual dollars spent, I mean, we we really um, did pretty well. I think it was on the order of somewhere like thirty to forty thousand dollars for the actual money spent. Of course, with staff time and all that, it, it probably was well over a couple hundred thousand dollars. But um, you know, this part of it was something that we had to do as part of PR and also. You know, it's something that we felt if we could give, give the jump start to this fishery reintroduction, it, it would really help. So we went out with electrofishing boats, collected fish, um, and then uh, transported them over to the town hall in these tanks behind uh, in, a, in the back of a pickup, um, uh, measured and, you know, weighed and tried to take account of all that we took out um, and held them there for about 30 days. And ultimately, we did stock them back in the Ridgebury Lake. Um, we also had this pre-treatment drawdown, the idea being that we had to draw down this lake low enough so that it would, any of the rote known as it came flowing down the creek would sort of be captured here until it was ultimately uh, uh, non-toxic and then it would spill out into the lower part of the creek where we didn't want to treat any longer. And so, as I mentioned before, we had all these various divisions that we had uh, different types of techniques we were going to use to put the rote known in. Um, we had to uh, uh, dewater that one lower pond with pumps because we weren't certain if there may have been some small snakeheads in there. We actually filtered all that water before it went down below just to make sure that we didn't have any larval size uh, fish that we were releasing below. And then right before treatment, we had to properly post all of the areas where we were going to uh, put the pesticide with proper posting. So all these things you know, took time and it affected sort of our rapid response. Um, we had pre-application uh, meetings with all the people involved, describing all the different areas that were going to be treated, all the different techniques that were going to be used. Um, we uh, then had this incident command center, which was a trailer that the forest rangers brought in. We had radio contact with all the people who were out in the field. Um, I think at any one given time, we may have had 40 or 50 people out there doing a variety of jobs, uh, and so it was good to have. We really needed to know who was where. We didn't want to lose anybody out there, but then also we just needed to know, you know, what areas had been treated, what areas were, were we seeing fish coming back from, that type of thing. 
Um, and here it just got more and more complex trying to you know, keep all of that coordinated. So it was very helpful to have that incident command center. And here's just some pictures of us doing the treatment. This is the crew putting to, mixing the, the full concentrated uh, rotenone with, into uh, water. We put it in through a variety of techniques. This one was actually uh, on a boat where the, it's put right in the water in the prop wash of the outboard. Um, there's hand backpack sprayers that are used. There's also, uh, from a canoe, we could spray it right out onto the ponds. Uh, and then in 2009, with a follow-up treatment, because we felt like we really needed to treat that wetland a little better than we had the previous year, uh, we used these uh, Marshmaster vehicles that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had, and we, uh, we sprayed through the wetland with that. Um, here's a picture of that in action. Um, we then had to... Uh, in 2008, in Ridgebury Lake, we collected all the fish uh, from that lake and disposed of them uh, through composting. Uh, that was a huge effort, uh, just trying to search through all the fish. All the fish. Leslie was really involved in that. Um, and when we found a snakehead, we preserved them. We cataloged them where they came from. But this is sort of what we found in Ridgebury Lake. We found tons and tons of carp and other uh, uh, species of fish. Uh, literally, we I think we pulled out something like 15,000 pounds of uh, primarily carp um, and tried to quantify all of that. Here's kind of a mix of all of the species we found. And mixed in with it were some snakeheads and some adult snakeheads. Um, and so we, we were successful in that regard. Here are a bunch of adult snakeheads. The primary size of the fish was, was much smaller, young of the year size fish. And uh, really, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but you know, all we found in, in Maine Lake was about six adult fish. Um, and uh, we felt like we had hit this area very, very, very well in 2008. We did not retreat it in 2009. We treated pretty much everything below Ridgebury Lake uh, in 2008, uh, 2009, and uh, felt like we were really uh, good in that we we didn't collect any fish from this area, which was the area. If you look over here. In 2008, we caught 207 juvenile and five adult fish, whereas in 2009, with the follow-up, we caught zero. Uh, and I think we even more effectively, uh, uh, well, I guess you couldn't say we were more effective because I think we got them all the first year, but we even did a uh, more thorough, we thought, job of, of including some areas on the sides where there were some tiny little tributaries and uh, wet areas that we hadn't in 2008, but it looks like we got them all. Uh, we did find more fish down here in 2009 through this area. Again, we were we really stepped up our effort in 2009, trying to make sure that we uh, got everything that and every little bit of water that we could have possibly missed the year before. In 2008, we had a rainstorm that occurred right in the middle of our treatment, and that may have uh, limited some of our success. And um, so I think we, we really have not, since this time, found any fish outside of the area that we treated. And even in the last year, we haven't found any fish with any snakeheads, I mean, within the area that we, uh, we've treated twice now. So uh, we're ca cautiously optimistic that all the snakeheads were killed in the treatment area in 2009. Um, and uh, in, in 2008, we felt like we were 100% effective in the upper third of the treatment area. Um, and, you know, hopefully we were 100% in 2009 with the rest of it. And still, there's no northern snakeheads that have that we have been able to find, or anybody has reported beyond the treatment area. Um, so, in in the end, I mean, we really felt like the rapid response was really important. We hoped that we got them all before they could spawn again, um, and that uh, public support and involvement was essential to the whole success of the program. Um, information, both good and bad, were easy for people to come by via the internet. And uh, even though they may not have been applicable to the circumstances, so if anybody's doing a project like this, it always helps to just do the Google searches because that's what people are going to see coming in, and it helps to ch have that heads up before you go out and do a public meeting or something like that. Uh, we still need to work on doing this a little bit faster. I mean, I don't know that we could have done it much faster uh, this time, but hopefully if there's ever a snakehead outbreak somewhere else in the state, you know, we have the steps in order that maybe it could even be uh, done a little quicker. 
Um, and in this case, we did, did have some hurdles with different types of chemicals that were used and, and, and how to, you know, deal with that and, and some of the public issues that came up. And, you know, if we could have uh, pointed to some past experience with some of these things, then we may have even been able to do that a little quicker. And, and that's about it. I, I just I always want to put this slide in because the Region 5 fisheries folks were sort of our fisheries uh, uh, road-known specialists, and uh, they were really essential. It really brought together so many people within our own department and bureau, uh, all the work on this, and that, that's really how it was successful. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Mike, and 